Okay, uh, hello everyone. As people continue to uh, trickle in, um, I'll get us started. Um, so my name is Christian Snowd and I'm the WASH Innovation Consultant with the UNICEF Sanitation and Hygiene Team in New York. And I work with the Duke UNICEF Innovation Accelerator. So welcome to this session, exploring market-based and private sector engagement in sanitation. This uh, forum is organized by the Duke UNICEF Innovation Accelerator, which is uh, a unique partnership that brings together Duke's expertise in innovation and social entrepreneurship with UNICEF's expertise in WASH with support from UNICEF USA. And we support promising sanitation, hygiene, and menstrual hygiene innovators to grow and scale their impact. So the topic for today, private sector engagement in, in sanitation. Maybe you think about um, sanitation as, as just, just toilets, but there are several different value chains in, in sanitation, both up to the point of containment, but also emptying services, treatment and uh, reuse. And of course, we have different contexts, households, institutions such as school and healthcare facilities and public facilities. And with this, there are many areas where the private sector engages, either through products or services, including financing. So we saw yesterday during the opening session, the scale of the current gap to reach SDG 6, and the private sector has a significant role to play. The, the private sector is central to progress in sanitation. They deliver the products and services that households engage with, such as to build their first toilet or to maybe upgrade a toilet, empty their septic tank, or perhaps treat the waste. So households will benefit and uh, progress will accelerate when there's a thriving private sector that provides products and services that are desirable, convenient, accessible, and uh, affordable. But beyond the products and services, the private sector can also bring new investment and drive forwards increased households in investments in WASH. So we're very fortunate today to have such a great panel, and we're going to hear from some of these, these inspiring people about how they're driving forwards private sector engagement in sanitation, what brought them into this space and uh, what the future holds. So we're, so we're joined by a uh, Saida Zaki, the Investment Manager at Grand Challenges Canada, Erin McCusker, the Head of Sato, Manish uh, Kelska, founder of Wulu, uh, Sue Leu, co-founder of Food2x, Chukuma Nana, founder of Toilet Pride Initiative, and Nandita Kotwal, the Business Development Manager at Sanovation. And my apologies for any mispronunciations there. So Erin, um, let's start with you at the, the start of the safely managed uh, sanitation chain. Sato has had a, a huge impact in, in sanitation through bringing you know, Lixel's expertise in, in product innovation, marketing and distribution through the Sato toilets. So you know, coming from the private sector, what was it that inspired Lixel to engage with this mission to achieve universal sanitation? And, and what sort of progress have you made so far? Great. Well, thank you so much, Christian, and, and to the Duke Museum Accelerator for having us all today. I think this is, as you said, uh, a critical timing for this discussion, and very happy to be here. You know, when we talk about Sato, Sato is a part of Lixel, which is a, a maker of global housing, water, and toilet technologies. And so faced with the immense challenge uh, that we have in sanitation, Lixel really felt there was an opportunity to bring our expertise and the innovation expertise and the business model expertise that we have to a new customer segment and a new aspect of the challenge. When Sato is, you know, as a business, we really take a consumer-centric innovation approach. And I know there's a whole separate session on this, um, but for us, that's really critical to understanding how we meet the needs um, of that first step of the value chain. So how do we get people in the value chain? How do we get people on the sanitation ladder? And you do that by putting those customers at the center. You know, you, you focus on the customer experience, on the product gaps, um, and make sure that this is a product that they would want, there's going to be demand for, that it's accessible, uh, there's supply chain where those products are going to be available, and that it's affordable. 
And so we've really at Lixel started by saying we can bring that business mindset, that toilet innovation into a new challenge. Um, and that has evolved with Sato since our inception to not only just our toilet pan where we started, but now we have um, several uh, toilet interfaces, we have connection systems, um, and we've just launched our Sato tap uh, for hand hygiene as a complement. So that kind of focus on the initial access point, driving demand, getting people into the system um, has really been our focus and somewhere where we really hope to bring our innovation expertise. And since we've started, we've shipped over 5 million units now to over 41 different countries. And we estimate that that's helped to improve sanitation for about 25 million people. Now, I think as you alluded to, and, and as we saw, the latest data shows that the old ways of doing things in sort of business as usual is not gonna get us to where we need to go. Um, a four X acceleration is really needed if we wanna achieve our global goals in sanitation. And so what we've really been trying to focus on is how do we build those partnerships, um, not only within a supply chain, so with our manufacturers, with distributors, with community leaders or utilities who are working in these communities to build more sustainable supply chains, but also how do we then focus on partnerships um, in other aspects of the value chain? So partnering with uh, masons, partnering with pit emptiers, um, and partnering, as we said, with sort of utilities or the treatment facilities to understand how we can design products that get households um, you know, with a toilet, make that easier to empty, um, but also make sure that we're contributing to the overall ecosystem. And so, you know, I think that for Sato, there's a lot of potential for future innovation in terms of the products that we offer at that first step. But we're also really looking to innovate and expand to make sure that the entire value chain is feasible and that we can start to develop new partnerships and new business models um, to reach our global goals. Erin, sorry, I was muted. Thank you so much. Reaching 25 million people, that's that's really impressive. And I, I really like uh, what you're saying about partnerships. And I hope that we can come back to that and explore that with, with some others later. Now it'd be kind of nice to move over to uh, Toilet Pride. Um, so Toilet Pride's a member of the second Duke UNICEF cohort, and they work in Nigeria to facilitate the market for sanitation. So they connect demand creation activities with convenient supply through working directly with sales agents. So Chikuma, could you tell us a bit about how the Sato toilet has changed how the private sector um, engages with promoting sanitation um, in the areas where you work? Yeah. Thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, I'll say to a very large extent, um, Sato is changing the face of um, sanitation business in Nigeria as it's creating um, unique opportunities for TBOs to stay in the sanitation business through um, support in strategic areas. I would say for the TBOs we've interacted with, we can see that the first um, support has come in the area of um, helping TBOs um, deal with the initial constraints faced with um, cons I mean, consumers preparing um, on affordable high-end products. Now, as a result of Sato, families have options, families have choices, um, and it's easier to construct cheaper and quality latrines, thereby contributing significantly um, to um, in the sanitation coverage in Nigeria. Again, we, we're also seeing that um, with the support of Sato, I mean, with the presence of Sato in the market, more TBOs are developing more skills and this is also boosting um, their, their, their capacity and also economy, especially for masons and plum plumbers. And for us also, the biggest thing we've seen um, that um, Sato is doing for these TBOs is the fact that um, the, the presence of, of this product um, is it's helping um, TBOs to have easier access um, to this product. So that way, um, TBOs are not struggling to get products in good time. Um, with, with this business strategy of Sato Lixil, which is around license and distribution, we're seeing that TBOs uh, are no longer struggling to get this product and give out to the people that need them or sell to the people that need them. In all, we would say that um, um, 
SATO is an exciting product helping change the landscape of central business in Nigeria. TBOs are doing amazing work because nearly all the latrine installations in, in the country, I mean, are by private sanitation operators. But I think where the big problem is getting the TBOs to sell more and sell well um, so that we can make progress in, in, in hitting the sanitation um, targets for the SDGs in Nigeria by 2020, 2025 or 2030, yeah. That's great. And, and Shikuma, what do you think it will take for these TBOs to accelerate to, to the next level? What are the key, uh, I'll, I'll, key things that could help them? Yeah, I'll, I'll say first, um, we need to um, um, strengthen um, um, demand creation um, from our work in Nigeria, we're currently working in some states where we're we're working to um, to strengthen um, um, demand and increase supply of sanitation products and services. And one of the things we've noticed in our work with TBOs is the fact that a number of these TBOs have limited um, capacity and motivation uh, to manage active sales and and then um, and promotion of sales of toilets in these communities. We're noticing that this is a big gap. There's also a challenge um, with sanitation financing. Um, a lot of these um, TBOs are struggling to find financial support to help them um, expand their sanitation business. Again, um, there's a big issue um, around awareness of this product. Um, I've talked about demand creation. And so these are big issues um, TBOs uh, are facing at the moment. Then again, there's an issue with sales coordination. Um, there is almost um, an absence of sales force for TBOs in Nigeria. So you have a situation where you have more TBOs trying to sell um, this product themselves, and, and this has not yielded the desired result. And that is what um, Toilet Pride is doing right now in Nigeria. We're working um, to stimulate the market so that we can develop a vibrant marketplace for hygienic businesses, for hygienic sanitation, where businesses who are eager to sell uh, um, affordable quality and accessible sanitation products can also meet with consumers who are equally eager um, to buy. And um, that way, um, consumers can, can find their, their aspirational product or latrines they want at an affordable rate. And, and the work um, has been um, exciting. The feedback has been good because, um, because of our work right now, we're seeing um, a sales force emerging especially in Benue, where we're currently working. We're working with 12 TBOs and about 24 sales agents. And then and, and gradually, we're, we're beginning to see that if we're able to, to, to strengthen um, demand, increase demand, and strengthen supply, we'll make um, big progress in terms of accelerating um, sanitation and hygiene coverage in Nigeria. Thanks, Chikuma. We're, you know, we're, really, uh, we're really lucky to have you in the second cohort, and we're looking forward to, to supporting you further. So let's let's stay in the sort of toilet containment um, toilet and containment value chain, um, but let's move from household toilets to to public toilets. Um, Manish, you're a co-founder of, of Wulu. Um, can you tell us a bit about the Wulu model and how you're planning to be a leader and a financially sustainable public toilet operator? And you know what inspired you inspired you to start Wulu and to establish a, a private sector solution? to public sanitation. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, excuse me for my video not working, but I guess I'm audible to everyone. And uh, great to be here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I belong to a, a retail, global retail industry. And while working, um, not only just the, uh, you know, just the workforce in retail, but in India, if you see the working women, you know, most of the activities, whenever it comes to, um, you know, providing public sanitation or uh, hygiene access, we call it actually, uh, most of the activities are done in majority in the, uh, in, in villages or slums or something. Okay. But I think one of the most biggest important thing is, you know, in the urban, urban scenario, uh, women and kids are left abandoned in terms of, because of the non-viability of a public toilet model uh, they are not maintained and they're not they're not really hygienic or uh, probably not uh, you know uh, viable or not ready to be used by humans okay and this is exactly what we thought in bulu so the the i mean estimated 150 million uh, women along with kids okay they have been deprived of a hygiene access and you know when we are trying to address such a large issue you know in a country like india or worldwide um, erecting physical infrastructure was practically was not really a possible thing you know 
firstly obviously it required a lot of money to erect so many public toilets you know reinventing the whole wheel uh, i guess i think it was it was important for for to solve this issue you know technologically and that's exactly what wulu the seed of wulu uh, the inspiration about wulu as, as i said um, you know uh, it happened when you know i mean i always say this that uh, the agony of a, you know a, a woman's problem can be felt only by a man only when he becomes a father of a, you know, one and this is exactly what happened in our case when my daughter was growing uh, we realized the importance of a public sanitation process and this is i mean a facility um, coming back to wulu uh, it's a, it's a, you know i mean over two years we it took us to create a model which is in a simple world it uh, in a world it is uh, more like a airbnb of toilets so you know the idea was that you know i mean my vision is that every 100 meter 100 square meter a lady should be able to look at a toilet because the the calamity or a disaster can happen it will never happen looking at toilet closer maybe it's a a period a pad changing a pad changing a diaper feeding a baby or or you know waiting i mean there are a lot of uh, a lot of occasions this lady needs this kind of facility and this is exactly what wulu did uh, wulu uh, aggregates and segregates and certify uh, washrooms in restaurants a grade restaurants and um, one of the biggest property wulu has created in association with toilet board coalition is world's first hygiene certification program and this is something extremely important and uh, with certification we ensure that the facilities are safe and hygienic for any lady and any child to be used now that as a result of this business and this is completely digital and technology driven so as a result of that you know uh, we can easily serve a million women and child you know kids in mumbai with 1200 certified washrooms across the geography of mumbai now you know with the same thing now we are going ahead with 35000 uh, washrooms certified and geotagged in 100 cities of india this is exactly the way we will be able to uh, solve a big issue of hygiene not only for the uh, you know for indian citizens but of course foreign nationals who come in the country and always face a problem of hygiene access wulu is a subscription model okay we charge as low as 5 dollars annually for a subscription you know i mean in an indian context it's a rupee a day one rupee a day for safe and hygienic washrooms to make wulu more viable uh, we uh, my 20 years of experience with uh, along with my co-founders we used uh, a reward point mechanism which we are re we are rewarding consumers especially women to use the washroom and gain the reward points and that can be redeemed against solving the second problem which is adaptation of uh, rather you know uh, hygiene products in india it's extremely low uh, on a global platform so this is exactly what wulu is all about and wulu is out there to uh, change the the entire hygiene access scenario in india and uh, we, we, I mean, this is exactly what we call it as hygiene dignity for every woman and a child in the country. And that's how Wulu is all about. Uh, Wulu is crossing boundaries and going across the world because all over the world, when, whenever people are traveling, they need to locate a washroom. So Wulu is a new discovery platform. And that's in a nutshell, uh, Wulu is all about. Thank you, Manish, for sharing that. I thought it was, you know, I thought it was particularly interesting. We, we often think about um, government leading the role in terms of uh, regulation and standards to improve quality. So I find it, it's really interesting to see how, you know, as a private sector enterprise, you're using, you know, you're, you're trying to do the same through, through putting forwards kind of using those standards and using those metrics for a clean toilet to try and sort of incentivize um progress which i think is really Thanks interesting yeah just to add one more thing we, we use a lot of technology and iot devices in each of these washroom to detect stink and ensuring that okay their hygiene standard is always been up to the mark or any facility which breaches this whole uh, hygiene standard they are automatically offloaded from the voodoo list and they will not be visible or offered to the consumer so I'm, I'm sure probably down the line five years, there is no going to be, I mean, we are expecting around a quarter million Wulu host serving the entire nation and there is no dearth of a washroom available. 
Thanks, Manish. So uh, let's move over from um, toilets and containment to uh, to the value chain of, of waste treatment and, and reuse. So Nandita, um, Sanovation was set up as a, as a private company with a mission to accelerate uh, safely managed sanitation in, in secondary cities. Why do you think um, private sector investment in waste treatment and reuse is, is important? And what sort of unique value can, can organizations like, like Sanovation bring? Thanks, Christian. Uh, really great to be on this panel. And I think uh, the fact that, you know, one win for me is that we've, we've had this conversation around the value chain or, or around the service chain, um, because initially the conversation was only around uh, the containment aspect. So what happens when, you know, a Wulu has the waste? So what happens with it? So this is where we come in. Uh, I'm Nandita Kotwal, and I'm the business development manager for Sanovation. Um, so our goal at Sanovation is to safely manage sanitation in African secondary cities. And we do this by partnering with governments. And our flagship uh, product that we offer is uh, we design, build, and operate innovative treatment plants, uh, which convert human waste um, into biomass or fuel briquettes. Um, and these briquettes burn two times more efficiently than your traditional firewood. What we do then is we sell these briquettes to um, industries and uh, with large boilers. So this replaces firewood and is more environmentally friendly. Uh, we also provide other services, which include uh, investment planning, uh, organized waste collection, and are also slowly venturing into the solid waste management space. Um, but before you know, I answer your question, I think it's very important to know a little bit more about the scale of the problem. Um, it's, it's huge, and especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And we've seen, you know, according to WHO estimates, about 90% of the waste is currently not treated. So a lot of the times, because our first MDDs were so focused on the containment aspect, uh, some of that has already you know, uh, been successful. But what happens to the waste afterwards? Um, and so one one thing we know, we all know, is this causes disease outbreaks, uh, unsafe sanitation management, environmental pollution, and restricts economic growth. And that's very important to know because uh, no country has reached high income status without uh, safe sanitation systems. And so, and this is just rapidly mounting with uh, urbanization. Um, so how, how does the private sector come in then? Um, two key points here, I think, are for, for the private se sector especially, is we offer more flexibility uh, and to pilot and iterate and option here in that sense, uh, because a lot of the times uh, governments who are tasked with the mandate of carrying this forward um, don't have the, necessarily might have the intention to try out new things, but they don't have the capacity to. Um, and then the other point is also we uh, bring in the technical know-how um, and also global expertise. I think that's something that's very focused on the private sector is, especially when you look at what we've done at Sanovation, we've evolved as an organization uh, from having a container-based model in 2015 um, to what we are now, which is working more with in partnership with governments. And that we could only do that, I think, is because we, we tried, tested, failed many times, but also learned from our mistakes and, uh, and applied that. And so that's something that the private sector always is, um, is able to do. And they're also driven by innovation. A lot of the work we do is driven by public sector sometimes can fall back on. Um, the other thing is private sector comes with a, a business mindset and that's where that's what drives efficiencies as well in the sector and as sanitation is considered a public mandate um, sometimes uh, the efficiencies are lost so this is what we've seen and so how how does sanitation as an organization come in um, Sanovation creates long-term operationally sustainable uh, waste to value treatment plants. It's something I already mentioned, uh, but it's at low life cycle costs. So we share the burden with the utilities or the governments. Uh, this is where we, it, for example, with our Naivasha plant, uh, we have the government who allocated the land uh, and then Sanovation uh, is operating that. And this basically helps, um, you know, for the next 15 plus years, for example, uh, the burden of operation is on the private sector. So 
focusing really on the PPPs. Uh, that's something that the Sanovation has done. Um, and this also incentivizes uh, operational sustainability. And we've talked a lot about, you know, the, the conversation has changed a lot now um, in the past few years um, to making waste into a resource. Uh, and that's exactly what we offer as a unique solution. We're just not disposing it, we're using it and making sure that the sale of these fuel products uh, are able to uh, meet the operational uh, costs of running this plant, which is something that is, is a major problem. Uh, you'll see, and there's a lot of research on this, is uh, treatment plants often fail, not mostly because um, they weren't built well, but essentially because they cannot be maintained. There's no operation cost to maintain these treatment plants. And beyond one or two years, a lot of these treatment plants uh, fail. Um, so that's something that we offer. Assenuation. Thanks, Nandita, for sharing that and uh, also for highlighting the role of partnerships and, and PPP in your model. Um, let's move over to uh, Zuleo. You also work in the, the, va the waste to value chain um, through your organization, um, Food to X. So tell us a bit about your model and how you see the opportunity for private sector engagement in waste reuse in, in China um, and beyond. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much, Christian. And as you have mentioned, our mission at uh, Food to X is to divert food waste to wastewater treatment facilities for efficient biogas production. While well, the biogas is methane, by converting food waste to sustainable biogas, we are enabling a circular economy. Well, before talking about our technology, I would like to share a little bit about the background. Uh, you know, currently over one third of the world's food is being wasted. And among this over, um, 30% come from restaurants. So most of the time, how we deal with the food waste, we deliver it to landfill and uh, we bury them. Well, during the routine process of food waste, there will be unregulated methane produced. And this will cause global warming because you know methane is a powerful greenhouse gas because it is such a potent heat absorber. But methane is important for electricity generation. We can also use it for cooking, for heating. So this inspired us to find a more economic way to change the uncontrolled emission of methane to a controlled way. Well, with water treatment facilities is an ideal place for us because it has uh, the anaerobic digester. Well, what they are doing is they use the anaerobic digester to break down sewage sludge to produce methane. Well, what we are doing is we add food waste to the anaerobic digester and um, we mix the food waste with sewage sludge to produce methane. Well, the methane produced is around three times more than the one just produced by sewage sludge. So this way we can create additional revenue streams and also we can mitigate climate change. Um, back to your second question about the opportunity for private sector engagement in waste reuse. Well, uh, I heard a lot of innovative solutions existed in private sector, like plastic reuse and uh, uh, waste to carbon dioxide conversion. Well, uh, one of the challenges is Many of them, they operate, they operate in a small scale as a proof of concept. So we need to build a mechanism to help scale up these solutions to much greater scale. Um, and uh, as uh, Nadeta has also mentioned, to scale it up. Well, uh, to achieve this, we need the, uh, we need the nexus of technology business and policy support. We also need to establish an efficient partnership between the startup community and industries with existing infrastructure. So in this way, we can, well, we can enable near-term upskilling more efficiently. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, those are some really good points. And also I, I hope we will, we will come back to those. So thanks a lot for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, Saida. Uh, welcome. Um, 
Grand Challenges Canada has has funded more than a thousand innovations. Um, it seems it, based on the website of which uh, more than a hundred have been in wash across both uh, NGOs and also some social enterprises. Um, in fact. Yeah, looking at your list of who you funded, uh, Grand Challenges Canada has funded, provided sort of transformative funding to, to most of the, the well-known WASH innovations and, and organizations. So you've really had a, played a key role in, um, in these ones which are very, which are familiar to us in the sector. So do, maybe you can share a bit about your portfolio and tell us about what you see as the future for, um, for private sector engagement in, in driving forwards and accelerating sanitation. Yeah, thank you so much, Kristen, and uh, thank you to Duke and Inis, uh, UNICEF for hosting us. Um, really great to hear of new innovators on the panel and to see some familiar faces. Um, we've supported Lixil and Sanivation and really excited to see uh, where, where their progress has taken them. Um, so just uh, just to give you a really sort of quick boilerplate on Grand Challenges Canada, uh, we are an impact first funder. Um, we support innovations uh, globally and across three uh, sort of broad pillars now where we're much better known for innovations in global health, but our, our pillars are sort of widened to include um, you know, innovations in humanitarian settings and also innovations uh, that are that come from uh, indigenous communities themselves. Um, and so the sanitation and hygiene portfolio that I um, that I lead uh, essentially comes within that global health pillar. Um, and uh, really it, it includes, um, you know, the portfolio includes innovations that are essentially beyond uh, the pilot stage. So they've established a proof of concept, they've shown their effectiveness at, at a smaller scale and are uh, now essentially require support in their next uh, stage where, where they need to get to scale and sustainability. Uh, and we call this stage uh, the transition to scale phase. Um, and um, this is also a bit of a, a plug there for you know any innovators that are that are in this panel um, that are you know that sit within the transition to scale phase. Um, reach out, um, reach out, and and uh, you know would love to, to hear more. We are starting to build a pipeline um, to fund uh, more innovators. Um, so Grand Challenges Canada, um, we've you know within the sanitation hygiene portfolio, we have strategically chosen to fund. Uh, sanitation innovations that are applicable in urban uh, contexts, uh, because that's where we feel that our, you know, the amount of funding that we provide and the kind of uh, non-funding support that we provide can really add the greatest value. Um, right now, the the portfolio focuses, you know, at, on sort of three different dimensions. Um, you know, in, in, in terms of you know services for households, uh, we're really um, excited about the prospects of container-based sanitation. Uh, we have funded many of the more prominent players uh, in container-based sanitation. Uh, at the municipal level, uh, we are funding innovators like Sanivation, um, you know, providing a waste value solutions. Uh, and then at the community levels, we, we're, we're essentially supporting solutions um, such as paper use, public toilets, and, and hand hygiene solutions. Um, so in terms of you know, where we see the future of uh, private sector engagement, um, it, GCC's experience um, you know, in supporting private sector solutions towards scale and sustainability um, has really you know, shown us you know, the private sector plays a critical role in, in three areas, I, I believe. You know, the first is in, is in stimulating demand for services, so creating uh, markets and creating demand that that previously uh, likely did not exist in those contexts. Um, the second is in creating you know higher standards of service delivery um, that is desirable for for customers. Like in the case of of uh, the Sato Pan, um, you know the 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 quality and the desirability of the product is really really key for uptake. Um, and and the third is in essentially creating you know possibilities and models for government to engage. Uh, with these private sector actors in in um, you know in public private partnerships, as an example, um, and this is really you know PPPs are essentially um, a sort of a north star for many of our innovators that they want to get to because they can't do this on their own 
indefinitely forever. Um, it's it's GCC. I think we've you know through our our learnings and and through the challenges that we've seen a lot of these innovators go through, uh, we've really uh, you know come to acknowledge that the private sector plays a, an extremely important role, but is not the be all and end all, and has to be a, a sort of you know has to be um, part of like a suite of solutions uh, that that get to you know what we call citywide inclusive sanitation. Uh, in the case of urban context, it, it has to be, um, you know, it is an important part of the solution, but it is not the entire solution. And so it really needs to be part of like an integrated and, and coordinated approach to, to providing sanitation in order to reach universal access. Saida, that was, that was great. Some really good insights there. Um, I've seen some, some questions in the, in the, in the box. Um, one of them, Chukuma, I saw that you you said that you would like to answer, and the question was around, you know, how do we engage or encourage private sector um, into into a, a sector where households have have less disposable income and there's less, I guess, less revenue and profit potential. So, Chukuma, did you want to take that? Or would anyone else like to take that? Okay. So if not, perhaps I'll put, I'll put another question to, to all of you. Um, so if, if you want, you could all turn your, your videos on. Um, and I think that the, the interesting theme coming out around how can we encourage more private sector engagement and you know what type of specifically what types of partnerships or collaborations would really accelerate progress? What sort of changes do you think need to happen to to take that to the next level? So I'll put that out to to anyone that wants to take it. Manish, you you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, you know when it comes to private sector, okay, and uh, then moving on to uh, funds or uh, VC. Majority, I think, uh, one of the biggest challenge which I faced last two years is actually when it comes to VC or funding, okay, either it's a fintech or a edtech, you know, that's exactly. But I think uh, we need to create the awareness on the sanitech, I call it, uh, sanitation technology or sanitation sector. I mean, India is pitched to be a $62 billion industry when it comes to hygiene and sanitation. But somehow there is a lack of awareness in terms of investor community. I, I would really like, you know, if we collectively, we can create this awareness in terms of, you know, on a, on a national and a global platform that this is the future of the entire thing. I mean, I, I believe and at Wulu, we believe that um, a, a nation can progress only when we can empower women with their hygiene dignity or something like this. Or kids, we can take care of the next generation for their, you know, a basic sanitation needs. I think this is something which I, I bring, I mean, I, I wish to appeal from this platform globally that investors need to look, look at this as a newer sector, which is larger, and there is a great opportunity to get multiple access in terms of their investment prop, apart from a, a social impact and you know changing the way people are uh, you know living their lives. Erin, uh, over to you. Yeah, I, I would agree with Kanisha and, and I think from some of the work we've done together in the Toilet Board Coalition, I think that education of the investors um, and education of the business case for investing in sanitation you know, is a really important piece. It's one that falls to um, not only the small entrepreneurs, but I think also to the investors and to the public sector utilities and government partners. The Sanovation example was a great version of that. You know, what is the information you need? You know, what are the metrics and what are the business potential elements that we need to answer for you to show that investment in sanitation has impact and has this tremendous value? Um, I, I think the other piece is, is really to think about um, how do we make this work for all aspects of the value chain? So Sato, for example, you know, we currently predominantly use a license model um, where we're working with our manufacturing partners, licensing them the technology to produce, but then we are partners together in the demand generation and the market activation. So raising awareness of not only the, the risks of course, 
but that there is a solution available. There is an alternative available. And I think sometimes that consumer awareness of not knowing that there is a solution available to them as a household, as a community, and as a business owner, I think in some of these other options, um, that's a big hurdle to overcome. And so how can we all work together uh, to raise that awareness, to promote uh, solutions that are available and, and potentially new business models that are available um, in these communities will help to make more of the sanitation systems more inclusive and, and we'll be able to reach those underserved populations. One final thing I'll say is that we do see substantially increased traction where there are these government sanitation campaigns. You had Swash Bharat, you have Clean Nigeria, you have the, the National Sanitation Campaign in Tanzania. Um, Bangladesh, for example, had huge uh, government support and advocacy for toilets. And those are some of the markets where we see that really strong traction uh, for, for toilet construction, for toilet use, and consumer acceptance of these solutions. So, you know, really in terms of partnerships coming together, not only on the financing side, and I think the point about O&M is really critical, but also I think on just awareness of solutions and, and getting people to think outside of traditional flush toilets and sewers as being, you know, it's not the gold standard. It's really just one option and it may not be the best option or the most um, effective option for that household or community. So I think those are areas where we can all come together uh, and really help drive some acceptance and I think acceleration of the uptake of some of these sanitation models. Thanks, Erin. Some really good points there, particularly like the, the reference to the, the large government programs um, aligns well with the, with the work that UNICEF is doing on working closely with governments to promote um, national sanitation programs. Um, Saida, let's go over to you. Yeah, so I'd, I'd love to just riff off, uh, you know, a point that Erin made around, um, you know, around KPIs and, and really enabling, um, you know, innovation in these models to become more efficient. Uh, I think from a funder perspective, um, it's, it's really, really important uh, that we provide flexible support um, that, that enables, you know, these private sector models to become more efficient, more cost effective. Um, and enables them to invest in, in systems, um, you know, technology systems, as an example, that will allow them to then scale. Um, but also to, you know, for these, um, you know, innovators to essentially invest in, in government engagement that enables them to bring along the government um, from the start of the journey, getting their buy-in, uh, as opposed to, you know, trying to create the silver bullet solution in the hopes that it, it will eventually um, you know, get the attention of the government maybe five years down the, down the line, uh, because I, I I think that you know the government um, or the public sector has has a really important part to play, and and it's important for these private sector players to understand um, you know the public sector's pain points, their priorities, um, and then considering those in in the design of their their solutions and. Uh, I would really, you know, again, um, you know, point to Sanovation, uh, who's done a really fantastic job at, at this. And, and, you know, I would also encourage uh, folks to go on, on Grand Challenges Canada's website, have a look at a really uh, awesome guest blog that Andrew, um, who's the founder of Sanovation, wrote on their journey from being this completely private sector solution to bringing the government along um, and, and, you know, having that be a really important sort of recipe for scale and sustainability. That's great, Saida. And Nandita, I'll pass to you. Yeah, I think uh, Saida is uh, doing my job for me and answering the questions exactly as I would have in some ways. But no, just reiterating what, uh, what Saida said and Erin said as well is we, we are also looking at, you know, we think that PPPs, uh, but uh, are, are a very important part of what the work we do. And one of the, the ways we're looking at this is through uh, potentially having something like a design build operate contract. And so what we've seen so far is it's very difficult for us to have uh, go into the sector. And, and Saida said this really well, um, is that you know private sector is a very important part of the sector, but ultimately it's part of an equation. It's not the equation. So it's very important for us to, how, how does the government help us or 
how can governments help incentivize the private sector to do their job well? And so this is where we see, you know, like easy processes uh, in terms of procurement planning. Um, this is a major roadblock for us is what we've seen, uh, especially in the fecal sludge management sector where there's a lot of private sector involvement, but it's not really formalized always. There's no set guidelines, there's no set processes. Uh, so this is something we see at the national level, at the local level as well, having, having some of these standardized procedures. Um, and then obviously, um, you know, like a DBO, a design, build, operate contract, which is essentially technology agnostic. So we're not trying to sell one technology, but we're making sure that, you know, we are incentivizing a private sector to operate in that space. The other point, one quick point here is also this, you know, making uh, sure that there are incentives and probably subsidies in terms of reuse when you look at reuse. Um, if, you know, something like firewood is available for free, then how does someone like a company come in and sell that to low income households? It's really, really difficult to, uh, you know, go into that space if something is available freely. So incentives from the government on reuse uh, are very, very essential on our, on our part as well. Thanks. That's great. Thanks, Nandita. And on, on this note of partnerships, it's something that I've been working on recently with, you know, as we've, when we think about our work on ending open defecation, the, the value chains there in the private sector partnerships and government engagement are, are a bit different to when we're thinking in the urban settings around safely managed sanitation. We start to get into some more, more complex value chains, perhaps, or some a more, a larger range of, of actors in that space between government and and private uh, different regulations and guidance and standards that comes into it there. Um, so you, you had your, your hand up. Yeah, uh, I would like to share a little bit about the collaborations and partnerships as uh, we have also mentioned the uh, government support. And uh, I have talked about that we can build the uh, partnerships between the startup community and industries with existing infrastructure. And also I would like to point out one of another way of collaborations is we can build a collaboration between the startup sector and academia. And uh, one of the researchers working in academia, they are uh, more experienced to build up the prototype. And also for people working in the uh, startup or industries, they know more about how to push it into market. So by building these collaborations, we, could, we can accelerate the progress. Um, I heard a lot of stories about researchers like Bob Langer in MIT. He has already have a very successful company. I think that is a way that we can explore more to build the collaborations. Yeah. That's a good point and another, another angle there. Manish, we can see you now. Your video is working. So um, I can't hear you, but I can see you. OK, yeah, yeah. so I, yeah. I'm back on video now. Thank you. Great. Perhaps I could come to you then in terms of um, for the Wulu model, like what type of partnerships would it take for you to scale and accelerate within India and, and beyond? See, I think one of the biggest um, property Wulu has built is about certification. Uh, certification to the, you know, to a, a shared sanitation, which predominantly uh, works in terms of uh, restaurants and salons, and you know, so this infrastructure is extremely large. And if government, okay, we have Swachh Bharat Mission Two now, which is a more driving, you know, so if we work together and say if every facility comply itself with certification and onboards itself on Wulu platform, you know? So that, that creates a, a trust in consumer's mind and a woman and child's mind too, really. So across nation, there is no single restaurant which will be left aside from certification and onboarding itself on. So we would like to have some kind of a support from, uh, you know, uh, from the initiative like Swachh Bharat or something from government to encourage uh, you know, uh, restaurants and, and wherever there is a facility, retail facility with washroom, uh, they can certify themselves and, you know, get themselves uh, uploaded on, on Wulu platform. Um, with that, we our wish list is to offer Wulu free of cost to consumers. That's exactly our goal is with government partnerships and with, with, uh, with government uh, support, 
I think Wulu can achieve that kind of a, this is exactly what we look forward. Thanks, Manish. And uh, perhaps, perhaps to you, Erin, because uh, you know, with, with Sato, partnerships have played a, a key role, and you've mentioned some of that already. Um, what have what have been the partnerships that have been critical for you to get this far, and what what sort of partnerships are you looking to in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you said, I mean, Sato really wouldn't exist without our partnerships, um, and those are at virtually every level of our business. Um, so I touched on. You know, our, our most critical partnership is that with our manufacturing and distribution partners. And that's part of our make, sell, use model, um, which is identifying local or regional manufacturers that serve uh, communities, have uh, plastics manufacturing expertise. And then we go in and partner with them through that license model to build their capacity, uh, supply the mold, and then ensure that the production of the product um, is done in a local and regional way. And there's a variety of trade and, and barriers for and that help us to resolve through that model. Um, but importantly, then that distribution and retail network that may be part of that manufacturer, maybe uh, part of our partnerships pr approach, um, is really about then getting into the the rural, the peri-urban communities that. Uh, are where the, the biggest unmet need is for our SATO products. And so those types of retail and distribution partnerships um, are also incredibly critical for us getting the products, making them available. Um, similarly, you know, we work with multiple NGOs. Um, we work with donor-funded projects on demand activation, market awareness, building capacity of masons, um, and those who may influence household choices and actually install the, the toilets. And so we collaborate with Masons in terms of training. Um, we work with NGOs um, and other community leaders and community organizations, again, to just raise that awareness of a solution being available, um, you know, what a, this, a solution like Sato can do for the health of their family, for dignity, for access. Um, and so, you know, those kind of, so, true supply chain partnerships, demand market activation partnerships are essential. We also find our partnerships uh, with GCC, with UNICEF. Um, we have uh, an MOU and an, an emerging partnership with USAID um, that we're really excited to help scale up, um, as well as with JICA and, and other major partners. And these are about helping to reinforce the focus on market-based sanitation. So really identifying at a systems level what are those barriers for sanitation supply chains? Um, whether that's moving products around, whether that's um, missing service operators in the value chain. Um, you know, I think standards were one that, that uh, Manish has referred to as well. But by working with these global partners, we're able to look at each of our markets, leverage their local market expertise, and then target and say, you know, where could the Sato product portfolio support community and government goals? Um, where do we see barriers in the supply chain and how do we overcome them? And then how do we work as more of a, a ecosystem and take more of a systems change approach to ensuring that those sanitation supply chains are viable? You know, ultimately, Sato could continue to expand our product line. We could speak with consumers, identify products, but if those systemic barriers around not having sustainable supply chains, you know, whether they're trade barriers, um, affordability barriers, you know, or there's not a place for the second half of the value chain to exist with, to reach safely managed sanitation, you know, we're never going to really achieve our end objectives. And so that's why it is for us to engage with such a diverse amount of stakeholders um, along the entire value chain. And we are actively working for partners, you know, whether that is manufacturing in a regional way, um, distribution partnerships, uh, uh, you know, or even other private sector partners who are looking to make a difference um, in terms of expanding reach or helping to promote sanitation products. So uh, we're very open for partnership, eager to talk to anyone. Um, but, you know, there isn't a single category of partners that I would say um, is more or less crucial because it really does take that entire ecosystem for us to be able to deliver these goods and services down to the community to meet the needs. Thanks, Erin. 
So, so when we had the, the talking points today, um, I wasn't sure which direction we would end up going in, um, but partnerships has come up as, as a key theme. And I think that's really nice um, partnerships in terms of how we can encourage private sector engagement and also accelerate progress. Um, so I really appreciate all of your contributions. I've really enjoyed uh, hearing from you all and from this discussion. Um, for anyone interested to explore this topic further, this recording will be shared out along with some resources. Um, this session is the last in the day and late for uh, many of our country offices uh, further east, um, but this recording will be published um, and, and made available to everyone. So thank you to all of our excellent speakers that joined us today. Um, tomorrow we have more sessions and in the rest of the week. So I'd encourage you to go to the virtual forum website to have a look at those and to sign up. And I see that Madison has just put the link for that in the chat. So on that note, thank you so much everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much. Saida, would you like to put some closing remarks? Oh, sorry, I was just going to send out a, a thumbs up to say thank you so much for, for hosting us and for having this important conversation. Um, and uh, it's, it's great to hear about these new you know, solutions that are newer to me. Um, I, I hope and I hope if there's, again, uh, anyone in the audience who's interested in, um, in support, uh, do reach out and share my... So that's not a closing remark. That's, this is a bit of a shameless plug, but uh, <laughs> I think it's important for, for funders to put their hands out there and, and say we support you and, and we're looking to continue to make support. Thanks a lot, Saida, and thank you, everyone. And sorry for my webcam change about 10 minutes ago. I, I look sick Thanks now, but ad, actually it was a, just a technical challenge. <laughs> Thanks. So, thank, you, every, thank you, everybody. We'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.